I think we all expect the highest quality care from whichever health provider we choose, especially when it comes to something as sensitive as end-of-life care. Although there are literally thousands of hospice programs in the U.S., the beauty of quality hospice care is that it empowers the patient and family to have the best possible experience at such a difficult time. Rusty was a very intelligent, loving, wonderful, well-respected well man in the community. Um, he loved everybody, had a good sense of humor, and he had an interest early on in politics. And in middle school, his teacher got him connected with uh, a, a state assemblyman. And Rusty decided to run for office in eight, when he was 18 for Campbell. And, uh, and at 21, he was elected mayor, and that was a big to-do on Good Morning America, you know, youngest mayor. But, and everybody said, how can you run a city like that? Well, Rusty did. He was diagnosed with AML, um, which is a form of leukemia, in 2003. Um, he was 50 when he was diagnosed, and he was 54, almost 55, when he, so he was 54 when he died. Uh, after five years of battling all the side effects, being in hospitals, in and out constantly, um, having heart trouble from the chemo, having lung issues from treatment, having a shunt put up in his brain, um, being on oxygen 24-7, his body was just deteriorating. There were two hospices to choose from, and we chose one that was a little bit closer to us one that been, had been recommended by quite a few different people, and it was also a nonprofit hospice, which was important to us. So during hospice, he was also uh, writing, when he was in hospice, he was writing his book, and uh, that way he could stay home, and the nurse would come to us, and it was just much easier for him to complete this goal that he wanted. I think he wanted to keep in touch a lot with his nurse, and as he got, he, he wasn't feeling well towards the end, uh, he, it was hard for everybody to kind of help him feel less pain, be in less pain. And by golly, they came and, and really helped. And it was frustrating, I'm sure, for them. Uh, but they kept trying to, to make him feel comfortable. And I think they did a, a wonderful job. With hospice, I expected uh, us to be able to stay home. Um, I just expected us to have a more calm life. And what happened was it was even better. Um, it was it, it affected me. I didn't have to go to the pharmacy. The drugs were delivered. I felt safe when I was able to call somebody on the phone at, at hospice and talk to somebody. Uh, I felt good when the nurse came and Rusty would joke with her and, and laugh. He had a great sense of humor and so did she. Um, it was just a wonderful, calming experience, uh, much better than I had thought. Every hospice must have a business license. That assures they have met certain requirements in terms of their business practices. If the hospice is certified by Medicare, that assures they have met additional requirements regarding the services they provide and the quality of their care. And some hospices choose to become accredited by one of three national independent accrediting agencies, the Community Health Accreditation Program, known as CHAP, the Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, known as ACHC, and the Joint Commission for Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, known as the Joint Commission. Accreditation, pure and simply, to a consumer should mean that this organization has voluntarily undergone an external evaluation by an impartial third-party expert evaluator to demonstrate that they go a step beyond what's required. They have taken the next step beyond what's required by any state law, beyond what is required by any federal regulation, to demonstrate that their practices ensure that that patient has the best possible experience. As a particular segment of healthcare, hospice is remarkably efficient in the way it delivers quality care 
tailored to each patient's unique need. Doing that always takes compassion, and occasionally, it also takes innovation. Well, Maya was a pretty normal girl. She grew up in South Austin and uh, one of three children, the oldest, uh, very artistic, uh, loved her friends, loved playing, loved our neighborhood community. She went to a, a magnet middle school in seventh grade, which meant she was academically a lot more challenged. She had a difficult year. It sort of burst her fantasy bubble uh, regarding childhood. And then at the end of that school year, she was diagnosed with leukemia. Uh, it turns out that even after the heaviest battery of chemotherapy, Maya still had 89% leukemia cells in her bone marrow, and at that point there, there was not going to be any hope for her to survive. We went from Thursday giving Maya the news that she would not survive to a Sunday morning visit from an administrative nurse uh, from the hospice organization to interview us for hospice. During that initial administrative visit with, with the nurse, um, she was asked what, what would be a final wish and she said, you mean I get to wish for anything? And she, they said, well, within reason and they started giving examples and Maya latched onto the idea of, of being able to swim with dolphins and they explained that, well, we can make that happen. We can fly you and your family to SeaWorld in San Diego and they did that. So that was an amazing gift. The other thing that hospice made available to Maya is um, this amazing uh, palliative care nurse who, who went out of her way to, to learn about pediatrics uh, and also made a connection between Maya and an elderly gentleman who she was the nurse for who happened to be an artist. Uh, the nurse knew that Maya was interested in art. She had another patient, 70-something year old gentleman, uh, who was a, a, very, a nationally renowned wood carver. So she convinces him to give Maya one of his carvings and Maya gives him one of her poems and drawings and without ever having seen each other, without ever having met, Maya and this gentleman made a connection and they stayed in touch through the hospice nurse. So to have someone from hospice come in and, and care for Maya and make sure that her needs were, were met and taken care of and then very quietly leave was, was just a very, beautiful thing and, and we always knew that we could reach her by phone. She was always on call for us and she would check in frequently by phone. She knew that we were a family that was pretty self-sufficient. We had been through this year-long cancer journey with Maya. Uh, we knew the ins and outs of her treatment. We actually could do a lot of the treatment ourselves with her guidance and supervision and she allowed us the privacy we needed to uh, spend the last six weeks of Maya's life at home and I've said this before, it was the best six weeks of the diagnosis. It was heartbreaking to think that Maya was going to be gone within three to six weeks, which is what the doctors had predicted. But to be able to be home, as she said, to have chicken McNuggets and to be able to go into a swimming pool and go to her beloved flower garden was a gift and hospice helped provide that gift. People often are surprised to learn that their personal physician can remain involved in their care even after entering a hospice program. Having the hospice medical director oversee a patient's medical care doesn't mean that the medical team from hospice comes and hijacks the previous care that the patient had been receiving. The hospice physician and the patient's private physician collaborate initially and often continue to do so, especially if that's what the patient prefers. I'm open to respecting that wish um, for patients just because I understand they're more comfortable with the primary physician. There may be a relationship previously established. So I've called physicians before and said, you know, this is what I recommend for Mr. Smith, but Mr. Smith wanted to make sure that that was okay with you first. And oftentimes I found primary physicians, they're appreciative of being kept in the loop. Um, sometimes physicians have told me, that's okay, you don't have to call me anymore, um, and please tell Mr. Smith that, that I I respect and I'm in agreement with whatever suggestions you make because the primary physician respects the expertise and the experience that we've had in managing symptoms. Many members of the hospice interdisciplinary team must be licensed and some earn certification that they successfully completed advanced training in hospice and palliative care. For example, medical doctors can become board certified in hospice and palliative medicine. Certified hospice and palliative nurses can earn the initials CHPN or CHP 
LPN. Certified hospice and palliative nursing assistants can earn the initials CHPNA. A social worker with the credentials BSW has a bachelor's degree in social work. The initials MSW signify a master's degree in social work. In many states, social workers may also be licensed with initials such as LSW or LCSW. Hospice chaplains are eligible for many certifications. Here are just a few. BCC, Board Certified Chaplain. CPC, Certified Pastoral Counselor. PCS, Pastoral Care Specialist. Depending on where you live, some certifications may be required. Others are voluntary. You can check with the hospice about the credentials held by their staff. Hospices that accept Medicare are required to measure the quality of the care they provide and report back to the federal government. We want to compare ourselves to other hospices across the country. And that gives us a really good indicator of whether we're doing a good job or not. Um, we also ask our physician referrers, what do they think about the care and services that we've provided our patients and families? So there's many ways that we, we look at quality, both internally, organization-wide, not just our clinical programs, but also, very importantly, going back to the consumer and saying, how did we do? And I think, uh, as a consumer, you should really look towards an organization that's continually involved in that process. Finding the hospice that is best for you or your loved one might take some effort. Sometimes your choices may be limited by your location or by your insurance, or if you don't have insurance. But if you do have a choice of hospice providers, I really believe it is worth the effort to speak with a representative from each. Ask questions, compare. My mom was Gertrude Weissman, and she was a remarkable woman. Both of my parents were immigrants, and they came to this country for a better life in that World War II period. Uh, they met at night school learning English. My mom was from Czechoslovakia. She was one of these people that was a born mother. She was a terrific mother, wife, sister. She was the person that everyone in her family talked to. She was just a very accepting, non-judgmental person. My mom had uh, health issues, an autoimmune variety. Uh, so she had a lot of problems prior to congestive heart failure. But what really led into a hospice decision was her congestive heart failure. What happened though is she had to go back into the hospital. She had a hospital born infection. I had promised her at that point that she wouldn't have to go back to a hospital again. I met with hospices because there was no other option if she wanted to stay at home. I mean, clearly she had to be monitored uh, and we wanted her to be in a helpful situation, a loving situation. Uh, in terms of nursing care, in terms of other people around her. And I talked to a lot of people for hospice recommendations, the social workers at the hospital. I talked to people I trusted. I talked to people in the building where she lived, which was a senior living uh, facility. Um, and out of that came recommendations, very high recommendations for two specific hospices. And thus, I called them in and talk to both of them. So I interviewed hospices uh, while she was in the hospital. I made sure that she was involved. I introduced the people from the hospice to her, asked for her impressions, talked to my sister, and we made a decision together about the hospice that we chose. Like so many things, it's chemistry when it comes down to it. It's who you relate to better, who would seem to be a better match. What did they offer? And we feel that we gave her eight good months at home with hospice care. Even if your choice of providers is limited, you should still ask questions. Tell them what is important to you and your loved one. And if your doctor suggests a particular hospice, it is perfectly okay to ask why he or she suggests that particular hospice. If you are less than satisfied with the answer, keep looking. 
Hospice Foundation of America has an online directory of hospices, a good place to start your search for quality hospice care.